Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and we're now on to chapter 19 of the story of art. In this chapter, we're going to take a look at Catholic Europe, 1600 to 1650, Baroque, far different from the eras that preceded it. What we're talking about now is Catholic Europe, Italy here, and another center of the church here, but by this time, the church in the east is the Greek Orthodox Church, and the church here in the west is the Roman Catholic Church. So what we're going to take a look at is the reaction of the Catholic Church to events happening in Northern Europe, which in many areas became Protestant and broke away from the Catholic Church. The Order of Jesuits was founded in this time period, and this church was built as its headquarters. The architect was a man named Della Porta, and what he did was really monumental in terms of developing a new style. Let's take a look at some of the significant differences. First of all, resumption of Greek forms here, but doubled columns. This is something the Greeks never did. This is reminiscent of a Roman commemorative arch with two little doors on the side and one big one in the middle. We have here this kind of a roof over the door and a medallion here, a big decoration, a curved and a pointed roof doubling, and also another structure which is very similar to a Greek temple here on top of the first one. And here's a feature that's totally unknown in Greek architecture. This is called a volute. It looks very much like the curved neck of a stringed instrument. Its function is to visually join the top part of this structure to the bottom part. This is very different than the type of architecture that preceded it. It's very distinctive, and it comes into being at the beginning of the era we call the Baroque. Now we're going to take a look at two well-developed schools of thought regarding what art should be and what it should picture. The school of Annabale Caracci thought that everything should be beautified. Compare this to a, a painting by Nithart a few hundred years earlier, and you'll notice here's the dead body of Christ, but it doesn't look like a dead body. It's very beautiful. The whole scene is very well composed. The light is very controlled. It looks very pretty. It's not a realistic picture, it's a beautified picture. Because the feeling of this school of thought was that only very beautiful, holy things or moralistic things, things of some, such dignity, ought to be portrayed in art. Contrast that with the school of Caravaggio, that is the school of naturalism. Here we have Jesus and some of his apostles depicted not in a very dignified way. Notice the torn clothing, wrinkled brow, just messy hair. Not very fancy clothes, but this very undignified act of one man poking his finger into the wound in Jesus' side. Even though the Bible actually says this, and this is what Caravaggio drew his inspiration from, this, according to the school of Karachi, was really not valid art. It was portraying things in a way that they should not be portrayed. Guido Reni, an artist that followed the school of Karachi and is sometimes compared to Raphael in terms of how he composed paintings. Here's a mythological scene. This would have fit the school of Karachi in terms of the thinking of what's being pictured and how it's being pictured. And Nicolas Poussin, a very famous painter of the school of Karachi, this is an outdoor scene, but the light is very contrived. It's as if it were painted in a studio, and this right here was a backdrop, not harsh sunlight. The shadows are just a little diffused here. Very nice chiaroscuro effect. And the whole composition is one of idyllic charm, even though there's an irony here. It's a tombstone, and it's essentially saying, even in this paradise, here I am, death. Significant, it's dignified. The shape of this woman even harks back to the appearance of a, a Greek statue. This, for two or three hundred years, was the accepted way that art with a capital A would be prepared. Claude Lorraine, very much of that same school, idyllic types of country scenes, the sky here with atmospheric perspective and fading into the distance, always it would seem something of classical Greek architecture for some reason being represented. So a country scene, but harking back to an earlier time. Now contrast that with Peter Paul Rubens. Peter Paul Rubens was very unique as a painter in this era. He was very much a part of Catholic Europe, and the scenes he painted in many cases were religious scenes, but his paintings are characterized by a lot more action and activity and a lot more people. Here's the presentation of, of a person here to the Virgin Mary and Jesus, and Jesus giving her a little bit of a ring, John the Baptist here, and a number of saints holding the things with which they're associated because they were martyred with them, this being sort of a grill on which somebody was killed. Here's arrows, probably St. Sebastian. Here's St. George, and here's the 
throat of the, the dragon that he's stepping on. Lots and lots of activity. Now this is actually a sketch. This is a very quick small painting done by Peter Paul Rubens. He had a large workshop and from this his assistants would actually paint most of the picture and then he would come in and his specialty and his real strength was in the way that faces were pictured. As this next picture illustrates, this is a picture of his daughter. He could draw such realism with the strokes that he would put of for example this rouge on the cheeks and the way that the, the nose is pictured and the eyes just with dabs of paint he could bring something to life so even if his assistants had painted much of a scene according to his design he could make it his by putting this sort of thing onto the faces and this is a self-portrait of Peter Paul Rubens very conscious of his high station in life because of his skills being recognized by highly placed persons and another painting by Peter Paul Rubens you can see the crowding here of all sorts of various figures, peace in the front, war being banished in the background, this sort of a fawn here admiring this fruit, and here's a, a large wild animal but in a very playful way. Now Anthony Van Dyke was a student of Peter Paul Rubens and you can see some similarity in the style here but he was a much more dour sort of a person. He became famous as a court painter in England. This is Charles I of England and rather a regal bearing here. As Gombert says he didn't feel that he had to uh, put on a crown recognized of noble descent, the God-given right of kings to rule. Of course Van Dyck was called upon to paint other nobles, members of the court and their children, so here we have two young men who put their pants on one leg at a time, but perhaps they wouldn't think so. They probably thought themselves very much a cut above others, and you can see that kind of that attitude in the face of this young man. Contrast that with the school of naturalism. This is Diego Velazquez, who could paint in a much more traditional way, but here we see a very poor man, the water seller of Seville, ripped clothing, furrowed brow. Very, very interesting work done here, picturing these objects, the matte surface of this stone jug and this somewhat glossy surface, but very, very interesting work here on this glass, how the translucency of the glass is pictured here, very much in the way of a still life, these objects around, but very much in the way of the school of naturalism in terms of the subject matter, and even in the coloring, these browns, which were very untraditional as far as the main emphasis in the painting. Here's a more traditional painting by Velasquez. Average compares this to an earlier painting by Titian, and there's a great deal of similarity, the very rich coloring here of the robe of the Pope, the capturing of some of his character, you can see this is rather a stern person. And a very famous painting by Velasquez, Las Meninas, the Maids of Honor, famous for its composition. We see here the artist, we're standing in the position of the people who are standing there for a portrait. This is what they see. They see their daughter, who was perhaps brought out here to amuse them as they stood for a long while being painted. We see even a very funny sort of a gimmick here. We see a mirror that reflects the image of the people standing where we are. Interesting too the fact that we know the names of so many people. This is Mary Barbola, uh, a dwarf, one of the maids of honor, and this is Nicholas Pertisato. Looks like a child, might have been somewhat older, and he's just doing kind of an interesting here, kicking this sleeping dog. So these are very amusing little scenes of court life as the painter is observing and painting a portrait which will look something like this that we see. Very, very unusual in the way that this is composed. This is just a close-up of that detail of the mirror, so in a very fuzzy way it shows us how the portrait that was being painted was composed. Prince Philip, another one of the children of the uh, King and Queen of Spain, at this interesting thing here is the way this portrait is done, so much is shown of the gown with such detail and coloration, and also a little dog, which was kind of a token of fidelity as well as a very cute thing to include in a portrait like this. Gombrich compares this to the dog in the scene with the betrothal of the Arnolfini. There, Van Eyck draws a dog in extreme detail, every hair drawn out, because he's very fascinated by what can be done in detail with oil paint. Here, Velasquez leaves things fuzzy because, in fact, the texture of a dog's fur is rather fuzzy. He didn't paint every hair, but he certainly captures the whole feeling of the dog, the fuzziness, the way the paws coming out here very relaxed and casual, the, the expression on the dog's little face. Very interesting, this type of fuzziness, this type of leaving something to the imagination, is a tiny little inkling of what's to come with Impressionist painting 200 years later. 
where much more is left to the imagination.